Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this pre-concert discussion with Chloé de Guillebon, director of Le Concert de la Reine. I'm Marcy Ray, Associate Professor of Historical Musicology at Michigan State University, and it's my pleasure to join Chloé in conversation. Welcome. So let's begin um, by getting to know your ensemble, Le Concert de la Reine, uh, which formed in 2020. What was your inspiration for its formation? So um, it's um, we got this inspiration while doing my uh, final exam, and where we played pieces um, with treble viols and singers, and we really, really, we were really astonished by the, the this music and this combination of the voices and the, the treble viol. So yes, we decided to make of it an ensemble to continue to work together on this repertoire. Awesome. And can you tell us a little bit about the ensemble and your repertoire? Of course. So we play uh, music uh, written for treble viols and uh, singers. So maybe this instrument nowadays is not very uh, well known, but uh, back in the days it was really, really popular and a lot of, of pieces were written for it. So as a, an instrument of the concert, of course, but also as a solo instrument and as a company of the singers. So yes, we were really astonished by the quality of this music and the beauty of it. And yeah. Right. We so decided. you want to be better known, right? <laughs> awesome. Um, what are some of the special qualities of this music and what are your ambitions with uh, performing it? Well, we um, focus mainly on the English and the French uh, repertoire. Mm -hmm. uh, for the English repertoire, we look more in the concert music. So it's really beginning of the 17th century with uh, or end of the 16th with this Elizabethan uh, concert music and where really the voices are really almost equal, equal to the voice. And um, we do also um, later repertoire, so French repertoire with uh, music from the, the end of the 17th century. And so mostly religious music like the Motet of Dumont and Charpentier, and but also Air de Cour and all this kind of repertoire. Awesome, beautiful music. And um, what was it like to form a, an ensemble at this kind of unusual time where a lot of people weren't performing music live? Uh, what, what kinds of things were you allowed to do um, without a lot of performances taking place? Well, actually, yes, of course, we couldn't perform a lot in public, but then we took this opportunity to more focus on rehearsing, recording some pieces, searching for repertoire, and really building our ensemble identity in the common language. And are all the, is all the repertoire that you're currently performing, is, is it um, published or have you had to go into archives to look for um, manuscript copies? Uh, for the moment, we mainly play uh, published repertories, but that are very rarely played, sadly. Oh, yeah, great. Um, so then um, tell us a little bit about the program that you've put together for the Bloomington Early Music Festival. It seems to highlight the numerous roles that women can play, um, from composer to performer to patron, dedicatee and subject or, or inspiration. Um, is there something that you would like us to know about these relationships and the, the program that you've prepared? Yeah, um, yeah, so we, we decided in this program to um, highlight more the, the role of the patrons and this very powerful women that uh, enabled all those works to be written and performed. So that was our first angle for this program. So of course, with uh, Mademoiselle de Guise, who protected Charpentier, and uh, La Duchesse de Chaulne, who protected, uh, who, who, yeah, who, who's Dumont dedicated to her, her Cantica Sacra. And uh, we, get, we kind of know that she might have paid, in fact, for the first edition of this pieces. So yeah, that was our first angle for this program. And uh, then of course, also we, uh, we included a piece by uh, uh, Elisabeth Jacquet Laguerre, of course, which was, uh, who was really a star uh, at the court of uh, Louis XIV. And, uh, and yeah, also the subject of the pieces, we wanted to highlight strong women from the Catholic heritage. So we have uh, Santa Cecilia, we have Susanna, and we have Maria Magdalena. Right, so uh, 
so in the pieces that you've performed or that you're performing from Charpentier, they they sort of reflect um, Madame, Mademoiselle de Guise's taste, her preferences for small chamber music and um, and her preferences for sacred music. Um, she I think he wrote almost 500 pieces of, of sacred music, many of which for, were for her. And I think that the piece that you're, you have on this program the, for um, St. Cecilia is such a wonderful tribute to her because of, um, I think she was baptized the day after St. Cecilia's day. And then she herself went on to be a patron of music. And then, um, and she sort of saw herself in a sacred role as being, like Saint Cecilia, God's instrument. You know, she really um, was very much invested in the sacred life of her own servants, but uh, but also of France, right? I think some of these pieces were actually celebrations of conversions. Um, yes, so, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of interesting connections. I noticed that your program has a lot of sacred pieces on it. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about I know in at the time they were talking about when they set the text, it was giving soul to the text by adding music. Can you talk about the ways in which um, these composers developed their subjects through music? Are there places that you would like the listeners to attune to as we hear your concert? Um, yeah, of course, the, the, they really put um, like the, a strong relation between the text and the music. Um, we can really see that, for example, in the in the piece um, of Charpentier, Magdalena Lugens, that, um, for example, where when she speaks of the um, O Amormeus, it's very, it's almost this line is almost uh, sensual, and um, with this also this cetragord going down, and then um, also when she speaks of the um, Dulcissime uh, and so on. Then it goes very sweet. So you can really almost hear the words in in the way he puts the music, and that's very that's very nice. And you can also find it in 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 the um, in the Suzanne uh, from Jacquet de la Guerre. Um, all for, for example, when she says no, uh, no, 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 with this repetitive no that goes down, it's really an, an image. Uh, um, the, the sound of the word putting into music. So um, even I, I, I think even as a non-speaking listener, you can also get the, really the feeling of the words and of the text uh, without really uh, understanding French. Right, yeah, so I know that uh, Charpentier was really close with the Jesuits and the Jesuits firmly believed in creating, uh, like even using secular music and the trends from secular music to bring uh, sacred texts to life. And so you can kind of hear this in his music. He's also, he was also highly influenced and as were all of these composers by Italianate trends. What do you notice in the music that kind of, it's it sort of, the goût réuni of, of Couperin, the, the two styles united in these pieces. Where do you see the balance between the Frenchness and some of, of the Italian, the sort of cutting edge Italian qualities of this music? Um, well, for example, if we take again the Magdalena Lugens from Charpentier, you can really find this, uh, this re almost recitative uh, part that really reminds from the Italian oratorio and um, yeah, and perhaps then the um, Saint Cecilia, the prologue is then a bit more in the French style. It has less uh, of this Italian characteristic, but the oratorio that comes after this prologue that we're not playing, but it has then again this very Italian taste. So it's always a kind of a balance between yeah, the, the two of them. And, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, exactly, and exactly you were you were uh, speaking of uh, earlier about how uh, patrons also influence the the style of music, and uh, yeah, I think it's it's nice also to uh, to outline, for example, with this Italian taste. We know that the Guise house really was in love with Italian taste, and uh, that Charpentier then, when writing for them, was really writing in Italian taste. So of course he studied in Italy, so we can understand it that he was also very kind of uh, fond of this music. 
But if you compare with uh, pieces he wrote for the French court, for example, then it's completely in French style. So he really adapts to for whom he is writing. So the patrons is not only a, a financial help, it's really also shaping the music that will be written. Yes, it's fascinating. So Mademoiselle de Guise spent um, so a few years in her childhood in in Italy, and so then had this taste for Italian music, which he with the, which Charpentier had just returned from Rome when he entered her service. So he really got a chance to let this flower at a time when at least a lot of the secular music from, ironically, a Florentine Jean Baptiste Lully was a very very much in a he developed a kind of French secular style, um, but Charpentier's talents in Italian music were allowed to flourish in this very particular household that 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 loved, in particular, the Italian sound. So mm -hmm. it's a nice, it's a nice observation you make that that Charpentier wasn't um, just writing in the Italian style, that he was very flexible and he he adapted his styles to to the different people that he was he was writing for at the time. That's exciting. Yeah, that's very good. Um, is there anything that you would like to draw our attention to in your program that we haven't already talked about so that listeners, when they're hearing your program, can, can listen for specific things and appreciate some of the things that you appreciate about this music? I have to say there, there is one piece I'm particularly fond of. It's a, a symphony by Charpentier, and it's called uh, La Nuit. So we took it from uh, another another piece, um, uh, but uh, so basically it's supposed to be the night where the shepherds are asleep, and so there is a symphony. And we took it uh, to make it um, kind of a prologue to um, Magdalena. And so, yeah, I think it's it's nice to um, while listening to hear to it to imagine Magdalena um, alone in her grotta weeping and. Um, this kind of very dark feeling. And this is a very, very nice introduction uh, to, to this piece. Awesome, so that it really sets the atmosphere for the following. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then you have several instrumental pieces um, as well, and, and many of them are based on French dances. Um, is mm -hmm. there anything in there that, that um, we might listen for since many of these uh, instrumental pieces in France at this time, they called up dance, but you weren't dancing to it. So what kind of gestures mm -hmm. or how does it call up the body dancing in these particular pieces? Well, actually those pieces were published in the Cantica Sacra. So they were published in um, in, uh, in a book made for the religious uh, in the covens, uh, mainly sisters. So it's not really dance music because it's really made for religious purpose. But of course, all the music and in this time is really heavily influenced by the, the dance and dances and so on. So this is why you can really find it in, in it. And um, I don't think they were really meant to be danced or moved on. But uh, of course, we can then um, uh, recognize in them uh, the Allemande, the Pavan, and um, yeah. And so this kind of, uh, it's more like walking dances, the Pavan and the Allemand. It's, mm, but though they have also this uh, small um, ternaire part, uh, so in three, that are then a bit more bouncing. And the, um, the contrast between those parts is very, very nice and very interesting. Yes, right, great. So um, anything else that you, um want us to know about the program like what should be our takeaway what do you hope that listeners take away after hearing this program presumably you want to introduce them to music maybe they haven't heard before that it opens opens an invitation for them to explore more but is there anything else that you hope audiences take away from this program that you've put together well i, I hope they will fall in love with uh, the travel bio <laughs> and that they will, they will want to know more about this instrument and all the music that has been written for it. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and yeah, I hope they will be also touched by the, um, the, the natural aspect of this music that it really touches directly the soul. It's, it's very, it's very, I don't know how to say human. It's, it's not, it's, uh, it's very well written and very intelligently written, but it's really an immediate effect on, on the soul, on the, 
on the effects. And yeah. Right, with the resources and the text, it's also very intimate. So this is an excellent opportunity to feel like we're sitting in the presence of um, Mademoiselle de Guise or Madame mm -hmm. de Montespan and really appreciating this music in a chamber setting. And it was supposed to speak directly to the heart and to the soul, right? So this is yeah. an opportunity yeah, exactly. to mm -hmm. take ourselves back to Baroque France and um, mm -hmm. and experience it the way that that historical listeners did.